Hi, I'm Amy McIntosh. I'm one of the pediatric orthopedic surgeons here. Um, it's a pleasure to um, be giving this talk today, and I am responsible for talking about the 10 most common orthopedic conditions that are we're consulted uh, to the NICU for, um, and I'll be happy to take questions at the end. So I think one of the most common reasons I go to see babies in the NICU is for what I call pseudoparalysis, meaning the baby is using one arm normally and the other one just kind of is hanging limply at the side. You can see here on my screen, I tried to represent that with this photo. You can tell this arm is moving and this arm is just kind of hanging limply at the side. Um, I think important things to look for is, is the hand moving normally? Will the baby grasp and release their fingers? And then always ask, you know, was it a vaginal delivery? Uh, was it a big baby? Did the mom have maternal diabetes? Was there a forceps assisted delivery? Or did it, uh, was the baby so big they needed to be converted from a vaginal delivery to a C-section? All of those are important questions to ask. And then the three most common reasons for pseudoparalysis, the first is a clavicle fracture. Um, you can see that obviously if you get an x-ray of the involved extremity. The treatment is really simple. You just take a safety pin and you put the baby in a onesie that has a long sleeve and you just safety pin the sleeve of the onesie to the torso of the onesie for two weeks. It's the easiest way to immobilize the arm. You don't have to worry about anything compressing or wrapping around the baby and just give the baby Tylenol for pain. There's no need for any repeat x-rays. All of these will heal well in two weeks. And I don't think that the baby requires the, um, persistent uh, radiation from multiple x-rays. The second most common reason for pseudoparalysis is a humerus fracture. Uh, the treatment is the same as a clavicle fracture. You just put a long-armed sleeved onesie on the baby and you safety pin the sleeve to the torso. Again, there's no need for a repeat x-ray. And so for me to show you this poor baby got four x-rays in two weeks, and you can see by two weeks, the fracture is pretty much healed. And by one week, it's a huge ball of callus. So there's no need to repeat x-rays. And I think the simplest form of immobilization is just safety pinning the onesie sleeve to the body of the onesie. The last uh, most common reason for pseudoparalysis is a brachial plexus palsy. So the difference between the presentation of a brachial plexus baby and a clavicle fractured or humerus fractured baby is the hand and wrist. So you can see here, this baby has an herbs palsy. The wrist and the fingers are held in flexion and the baby will not have any active extension of either their fingers or their wrist. If you see this, then you, there's no treatment necessary in the NICU. You can have occupational therapy come and help mom and dad with finger and wrist stretching, but really the baby should be referred to Scottish Rites Hand Clinic, and then they will be evaluated by Dr. Oishi or Dr. Stutz for their brachial plexus palsy. So those are the three most common reasons for pseudoparalysis of an upper extremity, and that is a very, all three are very common reasons I get consulted to evaluate babies in the NICU. Uh, next, I'm going to talk about developmental hip dysplasia. I know you have an entire uh, another talk on this, so it's just one slide. Um, but just to recap, the risk factors for hip dysplasia or hip dislocation are firstborn females, those patients that have a family history of hip dysplasia, breach delivery, or significantly low amniotic fluid in the intrauterine environment. Um, again, the exam, you can try to 
feel the hip either dislocating, which would be a positive Barlow maneuver, or reducing, which is the positive Ortolani maneuver. And um, you can look for other syndromes that might be associated with multiple joint dislocations or um, abnormalities like arthrogryposis or Larson syndrome. Uh, the most important thing is to get an ultrasound because that will help evaluate the joint. You can see here, this is an ultrasound of the hip. The femoral head is not concentrically located in the acetabulum. You can see here that the acetabulum is empty. And this hip is not just this plastic, but it is dislocated. And the treatment is pavlik Um So sometimes the NICU babies are too small to fit in even the smallest pavlik harness. But the earlier the treatment can be um, initiated, the better the outcome. So if we can get the preemie pelvic harness on, then we will start treatment in the NICU. And then, of course, uh, we would follow them up at Scottish Rite um, for till they're 18 years old. Um, club feet or a single club foot is another reason I consulted to come to the NICU. Interestingly, I do a lot of intrauterine consults, meaning I, um, the mom comes to my clinic when the baby is still in utero because the majority of club feet are easily seen on the prenatal ultrasound that is done at 20 to 26 weeks. So basically the prenatal consult is just me explaining what a club foot is and then the usual treatment. But basically, here is an ultrasound picture of what a club foot looks like in utero. This is what club feet look like clinically. And then the treatment is Ponsetti casting, a series of weekly casts, and then an eventual percutaneous tendo-Achilles lengthening. If the baby is going to be in the NICU for six weeks or greater, then I can complete the entire Ponsetti casting treatment in the NICU, but if the baby is not going to be in the NICU that long, then we often defer treatment until after the baby discharges from the NICU, and then we start their treatment at Scottish Rite after they've been discharged home. But I think the most important thing is just recognizing that depending on the length of the NICU stay, I have been able to completely treat a club foot uh, before discharge, just depending on the length of the NICU stay. Amniotic band syndrome or Streeter's dysplasia is um, another reason why a baby can have a club foot, but it is uh, related to the amniotic band formation. So basically the amniotic bands form in utero and they can constrict fingers or limbs or other body parts. It can lead to partial amputation of fingers and toes as seen here. Or in this lower picture, you can see it, it caused an entire amputation of the foot. And then you can see these tight um, constriction bands. Oftentimes, these children are referred to Scottish Rite's hand and prosthesis clinic. The reason that they get referred to the hand clinic is because of the amputations, but also one of the hand surgeons, Dr. Oishi, is a plastic surgeon, and he will do Z-plasty um, to release the amniotic bands and the tightness from them, um, in addition to reconstruction of the hands. If there's an amputation related to the amniotic band syndrome, then our prosthesis clinic just works um, on prosthetic fitting of um, limbs so that the child can, you know, walk and ambulate on time. I'm, this picture is a little bit visually disturbing, but I just want you guys to see what is not amniotic band syndrome or compartment syndrome. Um, I've actually seen this only three times in my 14-year career now, but in every case, it occurs when there has been intrauterine cetoscopic laser surgery, usually for twin-twin transfusion. And in the process of treating the twin-twin transfusion, there is 
some loss of blood supply uh, to the developing extremities and the babies are born with an obviously ischemic and necrotic limb or limbs. Um, really, there's not much I can do as an orthopedic surgeon other than to try to just prevent infection and allow for the auto amputation to occur. And then eventual, again, referral to our prosthesis clinic at Scottish Rite so appropriate prosthetics can be created for the child so that they can learn to walk um, and uh, have normal developmental milestones on time. Um, next is poly or uh, syndactyly, so too many toes or fingers or toes and fingers that are connected to one another. Um, Pre-axial polydactyly means that the great toe is duplicated, which you can see here in this picture. If the great toe is duplicated, I just want to um, impress upon you that it can be associated with a tibial dysplasia or tibial hemimilia. Um, so it's important to get an uh, x-ray of the tibia and fibula and foot if there's pre-axial polydactyly to assess for tibial dysplasia. If it's post-axial polydactyly, which just means the, the outer toes are duplicated, that is never associated with tibial hemimilia, and it's much easier to treat uh, surgically. Either way, if it's in the hand or the foot, um, refer them uh, to Scottish Rite, and often the uh, extra digits are surgically treated at six months of age or greater. Congenital knee dislocation um, is often associated with other syndromes, so it's important to get a genetic consult. This picture is very representative. It almost looks like the leg is on backwards and the foot is often touching the face. Um, a lot of times these babies are born a frank breach or they've had a C-section because they are frank breach. Um, it's really important to get an ultrasound at the hip to also assess the hip joint to make sure that that is not dislocated. Oftentimes, the knee and the hip are both dislocated at the same time. The treatment is serial casting. So basically, I can put a very small plaster long leg cast and slowly reduce the knee joint with serial cast. And then once I can flex the knee to 90 degrees, the child can often be transitioned into a pelvic harness um, to maintain that knee flexion. This is an interesting picture here. The baby has a congenital knee dislocation on one side and a club foot on the other side. So with serial casting, the knee was reduced, and on the opposite side, the club foot was treated with the Ponsetti method. So you can, again, see that serial casting is a mainstay of a lot of the treatment. Uh, for these very young orthopedic conditions. And again, depending on the length of time the child is going to be in the NICU, sometimes all of the casting can be accomplished during the NICU stay uh, versus as an outpatient uh, procedures at Scottish Rite. And then lastly, I wanted to talk about calcaneal valgus foot. It's sort of the opposite of a club foot. So you can see here the top of the foot is almost touching the tibia. It is usually an intrauterine packaging issue. The mainstay of treatment is just stretching and it gradually goes away in the first four to six uh, weeks of life. However, uh, there is an association between calcaneal valgus feet and posterior medial bowing of the tibia. So I usually will get an x-ray of the tibia to make sure it doesn't look like this. Because if you do have a posterior medial bow, the foot will get better with stretching and will resolve. However, the child is very likely to have a leg length discrepancy of two to five centimeters. So those children, it's important to have them referred to Scottish Rite because they're likely to require future surgery uh, to treat their leg length discrepancy. So that's if they have a posterior medial bow of the tibia associated with the calcaneal valgus foot. If it's just an isolated calcaneal valgus foot, then stretching is the treatment and they will not have a leg length discrepancy um, at the 
uh, end of treatment. And then I'm a spine surgeon, so I always like to have at least one slide. But spinal dysgraphism just means um, that the spine didn't form normally. External or skin findings that can um, be representative of an underlying spinal abnormality are hairy patches or a true sacral dimple. And then this is what I call abnormal fat distribution down near the sacrum, which is indicated of a lipomeningocele. But if you see any of these, it indicates either a tethered cord, um, failure of closure of posterior elements, a lipomeningocele. seal. All of these children would benefit from an MRI of their spine. You can get an ultrasound, but it's not nearly as diagnostic. So an MRI is the most helpful uh, test to determine the exact nature of their spinal dysraphism. But I just wanted to show all of these cutaneous manifestations that are very significant hints that the underlying spinal cord or spinal uh, vertebral elements did not form normally. So that's all I have on common orthopedic reasons that I get consulted to the NICU, um, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you.